Business finances. That's what we're talking about today. Are you making things harder than you need to with your business finances? That's one of the questions we're going to answer. How do we organize the system of looking at the money? Do you have a system? What is your business's job in your life? That's one of my biggest takeaways. Decide the answer to that question. And then we ask ourselves, is this business doing what it's supposed to now that we know what our business's job is? And Mark is going to share the best tax strategy and a few great lies at the end of this episode. It's good. It's kind of pushes back a little bit to what people hear and what they say and what they buy into. So <laughs> keep listening all the way till the end and enjoy this episode, my conversation with Mark Butler. Are you ready to work less, feel more organized and productive, streamline repetitive tasks, and implement systems that allow your coaching business to run smoothly even without you? If so, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Organized Coach Podcast, your go-to source for practical tips and solutions. I'm your host, Tracy Hoth, professional organizer, certified life coach, simplifying expert, and most of all, down-to-earth fellow coach just like you. No matter if you think you're missing the organizing gene, have ADHD, or just love anything organizing, I'm here to help you become an organized coach with a business that works for you. Pull up a seat and let's get started. Real quick question before we dive in. Do you believe that your work impacts lives and you want to reach more people, but behind the scenes, you kind of feel like a mess, constantly searching for files, overspending on software you don't even remember signing up for, you lack structure, you're wasting so much time. I've got just the thing for you. I want you to imagine your time was organized. You knew exactly what to do that would actually make you money. Your files were in a structure that makes sense to your brain. Your processes are running efficiently. I want you to think about the difference this could make in your business in your life. No more drama, no more beating yourself up. All that time you wasted can now be spent filling your business with paying clients. Listen, I know that getting organized might feel super overwhelming to you. That's why I'm offering you a free class, Three Simple Steps to an Organized and Profitable Coaching Business, where I'm going to share with you the only five files you need to organize your digital world. Head over to simplysquaredaway.com forward slash five files, the number five files for instant access. You get to watch whenever it's convenient for you. And finally, get a simple understanding of the three parts of an organized business, one that runs with ease. This is the first step. Sign up now and transform your business from chaos to clarity. And a secret benefit, learning these skills will overflow into your home and life. You signed up? SimplySquaredAway.com forward slash five files. All right, let's jump into today's episode. Okay, I have a really special guest on the show today, Mark Butler. I feel like everyone knows you, but I better have you introduce yourself for case there's someone out there that doesn't. Do you feel as famous as I think you are? There was a time where I had the sense that I was as famous as you just said, but I don't think of it that way anymore. Yeah. But but maybe I I think that nobody knows me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> kind of um, appealing, but yeah. anyway, yeah, in the last few years, it just seems like I am less and less known. More behind the scenes. More behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay. So tell us who you are, what you do. My name is Mark Butler. And these days I do two things mainly. I do accounting for coaches and I do life coaching. Uh, awesome. And when I say accounting, I don't mean tax preparation. I mean everything before tax preparation. So organizing people's financial information so that their tax preparer can do their taxes easily. Well, that's a question I had because recently I was saying something on my podcast and I said, my accountant, Mark Butler, is there a, like, am I supposed to say bookkeeper? Am, can you be called an accountant? Do you have to have a certification certification or what's the difference? Uh, I mean, I think you can call me a, an accountant. I do accounting work. Often people will say my CPA, not not necessarily about me, but they'll say my CPA about their tax preparer when their tax preparer is not necessarily a certified public accountant. 
Uh, you don't have to be an accountant to prepare taxes. In some states, you don't even have to have any credential whatsoever. Any it's like life coaching in some states where Interesting. anybody can anybody can prepare taxes. Most people would describe me as a bookkeeper, and I I'm totally good with that. I think that's uh, an accurate an accurate thing. But it's accounting work. So okay, so the name of your program that I am in or your service, what is that called? Let's do the books. Let's do the books. Okay, I'm. I love that so much. And you probably think it's so easy. <laughs> I am like, I love, I used to use QuickBooks and I used to put everything in manually. And well, I mean, my banking fed into it, but it just was, I would put it off till the end of the year and then have to go back and do everything. And I, the way I kept track of it, but now with different memberships and little payments because I have little digital products, like having, imagining myself having to put all that in is like, oh, I would dread it. And you just have it all set up and it just appears. And it's so amazing. Thank you. I'm so glad you feel that way about it. I feel that way about it too. I love it. I've been doing it over 10 years now. And what you experience as running so smoothly behind the scenes does run smoothly. It uh, it reminds me of a, a friend of mine who is a filmmaker, and you know, one time for a, it was like for a, a a church party or something, he edited together a long, what I thought was a long video with a bunch of interviews in it and stuff like that. And I, I said to him, "How long did it take you to put this together?" And he said, "Oh, it was quick, maybe an hour." <laughs> and he said, "Hold on, twenty years and one hour." Yeah. And I and that really resonated deeply with me because when I do people's bookkeeping now, sometimes I actually disclaim where if I have a new person sign up for the service, I can have their I could do 18 months of bookkeeping in 24 hours. And I think that gives the impression that it's easy and <laughs> it is now, but it is because I've spent 10 years developing systems and software that make it easy. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, 10 years and 10 years and 10 minutes is how long it takes me to do these things now. But it's really fun. And I love having the understanding that I do of the coaching community and of the co and of coaching products, I think uh, makes me really well suited to the work so that great clients like you experience the bookkeeping service, I think, as kind of three to five minutes per month worth of attention. And the rest of the time, it just hums along in the background. Yeah. So two things. You said great clients like me. So I listened to you and Jesse on Beginning Balance. Mm -hmm. I'm one of what you guys call the few listeners that listen all the way to the end. And, <laughs> and <laughs> yes. I laugh. You guys just make me laugh. You're so interesting. And your conversations <laughs> are so interesting. <laughs> I'm always telling one of my kids is kind of interested in this kind of stuff. And I'm always like, you need to listen to these guys. These guys are so funny. But you sometimes will talk about your clients. And I'm like, oh, I hope I'm not one of those clients. And so you just call me a good client. So I feel good about that. Um, well, we can, we can, uh, that's so funny because two things. First of all, my 16 year old son came to me the other day and he had a new friend in the car that I hadn't met before. And I can't remember what the kid's name was now. And, you know, said hello to him, seemed like a nice kid. And then my son said, yeah, he's listened to, he's about 20, sep he's about 20 episodes into beginning balance. <laughs> I, was, I said, what? <laughs> Why? He's 16. What? He said, yeah. He said, you know, dad, I have three or four friends who really like beginning balance. That's that so is awesome. Well, you guys talk about good stuff. Like the fact that you, I don't know if it's you or Jesse, make your kids read books. And then for sure, Jesse, that's definitely Jesse. Okay. And just your fights back and forth about personalities and stuff. It's just funny. It just makes me laugh. So, well, he'll be here. He'll be here in an hour. We'll be recording. Oh, our, our frequent recording sessions. Yeah. I've never met him. So maybe I can just hang out for an hour. <laughs> Have him poke out. his head in. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. You are a great client and we can talk about, we can talk about what I, I like all my clients. Some of my clients uh, make things harder than they need to be. And I can totally relate to that, but they don't need to do that with their business accounting. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So when I think about money, so I want to talk about, you know, we're, I'm called the organized coach. So I want to talk about the thought of organizing your money. And I think there's two aspects, the physical aspect to like, what do you do? What accounts do you put it in? What should you have set up? But then also the, I don't know if it's called mental aspect, but the CEO business owner management of it, the systems part of it, how should you check it? How do you keep mm-hmm. track of it? That kind of thing. Let's start physically mm-hmm. and just say like, what, what should you do first to organize your money? It's a good question. I might, I might uh, frame the question slightly differently. I don't really have shoulds. Mm. I do have, I do have opinions about what things makes things uh, easier or harder. Mm -hmm. There are things, there's a certain personality type or there's a certain set of personalities that think that they're making things easier, but they're making things harder. So for example, with bank accounts, sometimes I have really well-intentioned clients who set up a bunch of bank accounts thinking that that's going to be the best way to organize their money. And they're going to give each bank account its own job and they're going to transfer money back and forth between these bank accounts, depending on what job each account has. And these days that's mostly happening because people have read a book called profit first, Mm -hmm. which I think is actually a brilliant concept. I laugh about it because I tell people I was profit firsting before it was called profit first. And he just happened to create the most brilliant marketing gimmick in, I mean, it's an all time marketing gimmick message Mm -hmm. to the point now when I, when I have new clients signing up to my service, I will see that they come into my service with bank accounts named in the way that that book prescribes. Right. It's extremely well-intentioned. It could work well. It almost never does. So what ends up happening is I'm interacting with a client's finances, or I see that how a client has set up their finances, they have four or five checking accounts ostensibly because each account has its own job. But in practice, what I see is a bunch of money bouncing back and forth between the accounts and four of the five accounts always have a zero balance. (laughs) Or 75 cents. (laughs) Or 75 cents. That's exactly right. And one time, I can't remember why I did this, but I, it occurred to me, I wonder what other accountants and bookkeepers think about profit first. So I Googled it. And I, of course, as we do, I found Reddit threads of accounts and bookkeepers just railing against profit first. They despise it. Like, it's like all the accountants in the world, we'd like host a book burning. (laughs) And which is not fair because it is such a brilliant and important concept. But in practice, it's so much complexity. It's at high risk of being what I call complexity without benefit. Yes. So it's like paper shuffling. It's like I have a big pile of papers on my desk and once a month I reorder all the papers on the desk and I shift them from one corner of the desk to the other. Have I accomplished anything? Absolutely not. Did I feel busy? Yes, I did. Yes. Okay. That reminds me of all the pictures on Instagram of organized spaces like your pantry and then they all have glass or plastic glass containers that are all the same size with everything decantered into it and everything color coded and it looks beautiful and the concept is great but nobody keeps up with it nobody buys the next kind of cereal that fits into the container completely and doesn't have a package that is sitting around half full so it's kind of the same thing that is a fantastic analogy that it is it is exactly that it's someone who who thinks like, okay, I'm going to finally get a handle on this. And in order to get a handle on it, they take a very complex system and they set the system up and then they don't really do anything with the system after that. But the dopamine hit that they got from setting the system up was massive. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it, that's why I use this. I love your pantry metaphor. I'm going to steal it. I use the desk cleaning metaphor all the time when I say, you know, when you clean off your desk, you feel amazing. Mm -hmm. Did you actually do anything to move the needle in your life? No, you did not. It's a hygiene activity and and worthwhile as a hygiene activity, 
but it's not a creative activity. It's not an activity that moves you forward. It just feels good. So when people add this complexity into their business with multiple checking accounts or whatever, or multiple Stripe accounts, I, I'm i always like, you already have a Stripe account. What? Why do we need four Stripe accounts? And the answer is usually that we have a quote, online business manager, a virtual assistant who doesn't know how to connect the existing Stripe account to the new mm. platform they're using. So we end up with another account. It's not a huge deal, but over time we end up with cruft. We just end up with clutter in the, in the business and in the finances that doesn't have any ongoing benefit. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is if they want to do something like profit first, or I use YNAB, you know, Jesse, my friend, YNAB has the same stated purpose, the same intention as a service, like a program, like profit first. I always say, can we just get to a, a minimum bank account balance before we start doing new complexity with the bank accounts. Let's prove that we can maintain a balance of X for six months or a year before we start adding bank accounts and shuffling dollars between them, because there's just, the benefit is so, so questionable. I had a client the other day who I was talking to, she has a bunch of checking accounts, a bunch of checking accounts. And in a moment of boldness, I said, Hey, I know that you're Profit first workflow is very important to you, but I can't help but notice that while you've been running your profit first workflow, your debt has grown from zero to tens of thousands. And it's my understanding that the idea of profit first is that it would actually keep you from going into debt. And she took that like a champ. She was great to engage in this conversation with me. And she said, yeah, it's a weird season in my business right now, but the profit first exercise is so important to me. This exercise of shuffling the money between the accounts, it gives me so much comfort. I'll never stop doing it. And I said, fair enough. As long as you acknowledge that you are, it is truly now just a paper shuffling exercise because if the debt is growing, that means there isn't profit. And if there isn't profit, then there's no profit first. Yes. So you're just pipe. You're just, reorganizing piles of money, but the money that you're reorganizing in different piles, all of it came from that credit card over there. So you took a bunch of money from the credit card, you stacked it up on your desk, and then you shuffled it into piles. Why are we doing this? That's questionably useful. Yes. If, if your business is going into debt, it's not because your money piles aren't correctly organized. It's because something else is going on. And I, I get it. My business has been in debt. I, the, I don't, I'm not like, anti, I'm not dogmatic about debt. It's just a signal. Yeah. Anyway. So, so then what does someone do? So they start their business. Should they just have a checking and a savings? I mean, or, is that or, or the easiest? A, or just a checking. Hmm. What? I mean, it, it Okay, the the one area where I think I can understand multiple bank accounts, like two bank accounts, is a checking account in which you do all your operating, the money comes in, the money goes out. And then maybe a savings account in which you store money for taxes. Mhm. Mm I I don't that I think that's great. I think it's fine. Um you many people don't understand that you don't need an account for taxes if you don't have any profit because you only have taxes if you have profit. Yeah. So I'll have people who are, whose business is losing money, but they're still very worried about taxes. Totally get it because taxes is kind of this boogeyman, especially for newer business owners. But I just tell them if you're spending more money in your business than you're making in your business, then we don't need to set aside money for taxes because you have no profit. So don't worry about it. So, yeah, I didn't even think about just a checking account. That would be the most simple way to set it up. I mean, number one, have a checking account. <laughs> okay. Jesse and I, I don't know if the episode's been published yet. Jesse and I have talked about this on Beginning Balance. Sometimes I use him as an example because I think that in our world, coaches, solo operators, freelancers, whatever, I think we tend to think that our businesses are very, very different from a business like YNAB that has 
almost 200 employees and millions and millions of dollars in revenue per year. And yes, there are many big differences, but in terms of the banking setup, in a recent episode of our show, Jesse said, oh yeah, I just opened my second checking account in 20 years. I mean, I could guess how many millions of dollars in revenue, it's probably not my place to do it, but we're talking 20 years, millions and millions of dollars passing through this business. He opened one new checking account and it's because his new bookkeeper said that she really prefers to have the payroll come out of a separate account. And she's got her reasons. He said her reasons were fine. So I went ahead and did it. Mm. Well, I think that that is, I heard that episode because I wrote down, do you do anything like open bank accounts? I heard you and Jesse talking about that. So I wrote that down. That's funny. Yeah. Just, just a checking account. Okay. My sister has a business that's very similar to mine. She does more coaching in her business. Her focus tends to be more coaching. My business tends to be more bookkeeping. Her clients tend to be more like uh, multi six figure or multi million dollar earners. My clients at this point tend to be not there. They tend to be newer, but there's so many parallels between our two businesses. And I was, I was asking her about this multi bank account thing. I said, why are they doing this, Emily? Why are they doing this? And she said, Mark, it's because they think it gives them more money. And I was like, oh, of course, that's what it, that, why else would they do it? They think it gives them more money. It doesn't, but they think it does. So they keep opening bank accounts. Thinking about why someone would do that. And it's because I think because you're supposed to act like you're a million dollar earner, hundred thousand dollar earner, whatever number you put there. And you're supposed to do things in the way that someone with more money would do them. So you're in the practice of doing them. But it's good to know that people that make more money don't do those things. So that's not a practice you have to have. Oh, that is brilliant. It had not occurred to me. That is so helpful to me to hear you say that. Of course, that's a big factor in why it's happening. I've been inside those businesses. They're Trust not me, their, their success or failure does not ride on the third or fifth checking account. Yeah. It's, it's just not relevant. It's, it's so helpful that you said that. People who are looking to these supposed six-figure or million-dollar earners, and I only say supposed because I don't know whether they are or aren't. I'm at a point in the world of coaching where if someone says makes any financial claim whatsoever, I want to ask them for their P&L. Like, no, don't give me one number. Don't give me the number that suits you. Show me the P&L. Mm -hmm. I want to see if you're going to use one number, I want to see all the numbers. And if you're only going to use one number, then you've, I don't trust you anymore. Yeah. And I would ask people to consider me, if maybe they don't know my experience, I've been behind the scenes in so many of these businesses and I'm the one saying, don't tell me one number, show me the whole P and L. And I'm going to hope that people can get themselves conceptually from A to B to C there and stop listening to people's claims about earnings and profit and whatever, you have to ask yourself what a person's incentive is for saying what they're saying. If they didn't have a reason to say what they're saying, if they didn't have an incentive to say it, they would not be saying it. Mm. So this kind of advice in the best case scenario, let's say you have somebody who legitimately earns millions of dollars per year. Their day-to-day -day experience of their business is so different from yours that there's not a lot of reason for you to be paying attention to what they do in their business. They don't remember, remember, I worked for them. Mm -hmm. They don't remember what it's like to be you. Yeah. They know what it's like to be them. So whether we're talking about marketing or money management, they don't have a lot to offer you except maybe inspiration. Maybe. Mm. But other than that, in terms of the day-to-day -day of your business and how to market it and et cetera, nope. Okay. So now then that brings me to thinking, we're keeping it simple. And yeah, I read Profit First a while back. It was just too much. Like I want to do minimal work. And it was too much for me to keep doing, keep well opening all those and then thinking about tracking the fees that are going to come with it. But not to say if anyone's doing that, you can choose what you want to do. I'm not judging it. But now we, if we set it up as simple as possible and we have one bank account, how do we organize our system of looking at the money what what how do we keep that simple first of all and then what would that include what's your advice it's a really good question 
And the answer is, in a, if we're talking about a coaching business, where a person is offering some, some combination of one-on-one coaching, group coaching, maybe the occasional retreat, maybe they sell a couple of digital courses, there is so little to be aware of. We don't have a fleet of trucks. We don't have five, you know, teams that are out performing services in the world. We have a Stripe account, a PayPal account, probably. We might use Kajabi. Great. It's so funny to be in the game for as long as I have because I watch the platform evolution. It's like, it's just funny what platform is in vogue. Anyway, right. so we have Stripe, we have PayPal, we have maybe we have something like Kajabi. We have a calendaring system like an acuity or a calendly or tidy cal we probably have a zoom subscription maybe we have a virtual assistant maybe we're paying let's do the books for bookkeeping there's just not that much going on so when people over the years over and over people have said to me well i just know i've really got to be in tune with my numbers and i'm the guy who tracks the numbers and i keep saying to them What do you mean when you say that? (laughs) What numbers? Well, I just want to be smart about my numbers. Like Again, what numbers are we talking about? Well, I don't know. My business coach said something. Okay, your business coach. Perfect. I don't know what we're talking about. Well, I mean, what would it be? Revenue? Yeah, the money going, the money coming in and the money going out. What you find in the in a coaching business, which our businesses are so beautiful, they're so simple. There's just not that much complexity in the money going out because it's like five subscriptions, maybe a virtual assistant, maybe a bookkeeper, a, a, maybe a, a coach or so, a couple of courses that you do. There's just not that much going on there. So if you looked at it for five minutes a month, you'd say, oh, okay, this much money came in and that much money went out. And that is useful to sort of recenter yourself and say, oh, I'm spending more than I'm making. What do I want to do with that? Do I care? Do I want to do anything with that? But in terms of knowing your numbers, in your email, you asked me what are the maybe the biggest mistakes coaches make with money. And I don't really frame it that way because I don't, there's not really right or wrong with this. Mm-hmm. It's all about well, what's what is your business's job in your life? For many, many, many coaches, it turns out that their business's job in their life is to give them a community, something fun to do, something challenging and stimulating, a place to be of service, and it is not actually to make a lot of money. That's interesting. Like They probably want it to be. No, they say they want it to be. They say they want it to be because... Within the community that they enjoy being part of, uh, the ability to claim certain amounts of of profit or income it it's a status it's a status thing it's a, it's a way of increasing your uh, position within the community. Mm-hmm. Also, many many coaches, uh, more women tend to be coaches than men, and many of the women who are coaches and I'm generalizing, but I've got the receipts, I've got data, ten years worth of experience women tend to get into coaching more than men. And many of the women who get into coaching tend to come from sort of upper middle income or higher economic status households. So unless they make a bunch of money in their business, the money they make probably doesn't move the needle that much in their household. Mm -hmm. So what's the money's job? Sometimes it's for them to have a sense of like, I want to make my own thing. I want to do this, which I fully endorse. And I think it's amazing. It's amazing how many times over the years I've had people say to me, I want my business to make enough money that I can pay for an amazing trip for, you know, either my family or for the whole extended family. Also, in my opinion, a fantastic goal. So fun, incredible. What's interesting to me is how frequently that is the goal. Mm. And there's also another goal that's very common, which is I want to quote, retire my husband because retiring your husband is also a huge status thing in the coaching community. Oh, I retired my husband, also the influencer community. I do not like that goal. I think it's not great. 
<laughs> but it comes up a lot. When people say, well, how do I look at my money? I say, well, what is your business's job? Is your business's job to give you a great community and a great hobby? Well, no, I want to make a bunch of money. Okay. Do you? Your activity doesn't necessarily show that that's your goal. Your activity says you want a community and a really challenging service-oriented hobby, and I'm for that. If that's what your business's job is, let's try to have the amount of money that goes out of the business approximately match the amount of money that comes into the business so that this, and I think I'm afraid people think I'm diminishing it by calling it a hobby, call it something better than a hobby. I just mean a place of contribution and meaning and challenge whose primary job is not financial. Let's not worry about how much, like, do you have to study your numbers? No. But you if just you have to like, make no. sure one number is bigger than the other. On average, although in many households, not even that. Because in many households, if the coaching business is losing money, that's helping the household taxes. Mm. So we're getting all this contribution and rich relationships and enjoyment and learning. We're getting all these things and a tax deduction. Yes. And everybody's right winning at a write off. Everybody's <laughs> right. winning. Yeah. So it's all about what is the business's job. Now, if someone comes to me and says, yeah, it's all nice for those people who you're describing. That's not me. Right. Our family's going to use this money. And then my answer to them is going to be cool. Stop signing up for masterminds. Yes. And I know that's super blunt, Tracy. I know. But if people want to ask like, well, where does money go in a coaching business? Well, it goes to masterminds and to the plane tickets and hotels related to those masterminds. Mm. Where else does the money go? Um, to an overpriced online business manager that you don't really have a need for? Yeah. Where else? Nowhere. That's it. <laughs> it's just so fun to sign up for all this stuff. Oh, so fun. I fully support it unless making money is your goal. Yeah. Okay. So in defense of all the people out there that, you know, it, that's a good point that you're making to really first know what your goal is honestly but i think honestly those people w do want to make more money they want to make money in their business and have a large profit i mean they may not be doing it but they may be that's that is their desire so what advice would you tell them this is this is where a message can be so specifically tailored to the coaching community. What I can say with great confidence to people in the coaching community is there is not the relationship, the strong correlation between participation in uh, high ticket group coaching masterminds or certifications. There is not the correlation between that and increased money that mm -hmm. you think there is. Yes. There just is not. I challenged my sister once because our businesses are so similar, serving the same community. I said, thought experiment. Imagine we line up all of our clients that we've ever had in our, our combined in our, in our two services, our two businesses. Do you think you could look at the revenue? If we lined up the clients and had them hold, each of them hold a card that said, this is how much revenue I bring into my business. Do you think we would be able to spot the ones that participate in high ticket group coaching and masterminds? Mm. She goes, of course not. <laughs> I said, thank you. Of course not. She said, it doesn't correlate the way people think it does. Where people tend to make money through those kinds of experiences is if their prospective clients are in those rooms. Mm hmm then that money looks like a marketing expense because I have to pay to be in the room and my clients are in the room. For somebody like me or my sister who serve clients, uh, who serve coaches and who are sort of best positioned to serve coaches who are generating money, we should pay to be in those masterminds. Neither one of us does, but we should pay to be in those masterminds because our prospects are in the room. If I'm the average newish coach, and someone's offering me, uh, you know, a group coaching experience or uh, a mastermind. I'm. It's not never for me. I'm not that dogmatic. 
But if I'm seeing that someone is signing up for their third of these things, and I, I'll say, hey, in fact, I've done it sometimes. Hey, I just, do you notice how you keep spending this money in this way and there's not a corresponding bump in the income? It's actually really sad and it's really painful to see how hard it is for some coaches to say, I guess that doesn't actually do anything for my revenue or my profit. I just like it. Yeah. And, and then I say, I love that you like it. If you want to be in that room, I want you to be in that room unless that money has another more important job in your life. Mm -hmm. And if it does, then let's spend it there. And if it doesn't, then by all means, fly wherever, stay in the hotel. I love it. Yeah. Unless that money has a, has a more important job in your life. That's such a good, okay, everyone listening, just a good challenge for you to look at your own business and see where you're spending money and the outcome that it's producing for you. But are they coaches, Tracy? Are, is your audience coaches? Yeah, mostly coaches. Okay, then it, I already told you where their money's going. <laughs> I know where their money's <laughs> going. <laughs> okay, they need to look at their numbers they, and just say, too. why do I do that? I think it's because it's the marketing behind it, but it's also like, oh, we just need that. And then we'll get to where we want to go. Yeah, I think people buy sales pages. And what I mean is I think literally people purchase the sales page. They, they, the feeling you get when you read great copy and mm -hmm. you see the photography and maybe it's got video and there's a success story and she looks like me. It's, it's, Incredible. And I think yeah. that's what people purchase. And the dopamine dump that you get when you make that purchase, huge. Yeah. Especially if that sales copy has told you that what you're doing is brave and that it's scary and that you're making a big commitment to yourself and that you're overcoming great things by putting your credit card number into this form. All of that combines to make you think, like, I've just done something really incredible by paying this person this money. And maybe you have, maybe, maybe not. Succeeding in business mostly looks really, really boring. So the more excited you have to be, the more energy you have to generate, the more emotion you have to generate to take activity, to take a given action in your business, the less likely it is to have any relationship to success. So what do you think is the key to success? It's finding a thing where when you offer it to people, some percentage of them accept the offer and then later thank you for the work that you did and then tell other people to engage with you repeated times a million for decades. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I love using Jesse's example because I, I'm closer to his very successful business now than I am to any other business that's operating in the you know millions and millions. YNAB is turning 20 years old this year. I have been friends, very good friends with Jesse Meekham for 15 years. So for 15 of the 20 years of YNAB's existence, I've been good friends with Jesse. Do you know how boring YNAB looks day in and day out? The meetings that he sits in, the conversations that he's having with his team, YNAB has its four rules of something, four rules of money management. Their job has been to, they might, I don't know, maybe those are evolving now. I don't know. I, I don't pay that close of attention to that. But YNAB's job has been to doggedly repeat and promote those rules for 20 years. Day to day, nothing could look more boring. It's just, that's what success looks like. It's like being physically fit, which I frankly don't know that much about, but I see physically fit people. <laughs> and what do they do? They watch what they eat. They do some weight training. They do some walking or jogging, running, whatever, some the appropriate type and amount of cardio forever. Super boring. Consistency. So many people get into the coaching world because it's so exciting. It's like, it's like a rush. And it feels scary to even try it. So when it feels scary to try it, we're looking for solutions whose emotional tone matches ours. So if I feel scared and then I see a sales page and the sales page says, you're probably scared. 
now we have emotional resonance and now I'm primed to say, they get me, they get my emotional experience. The solution they're suggesting is probably the right one. And it is sometimes and other times not the bet. If, if Jesse won't do this, I love using him as an example. Jesse won't coach. He won't help other people succeed in business. Not because he's, he, he wants other people to succeed. He's just like, no, I don't, who's got time for that? I don't. And he's also, <laughs> he's done some speaking. It's funny because he hates it because he doesn't have enough control. People won't do what he says, which is so entertaining for me. But <laughs> Jesse would say to people, oh, you want to succeed in business? Okay. Well, you got to sort of find your groove and stay there for a couple decades. And they might be like, oh, but do I need to get on an airplane and fly and spend four days with you in person and stay at the four seasons and have a whatever? He would be so confused. <laughs> like, Why? Why would you do that? No, no, you don't need to get on an airplane and fly across the country. You need to offer people your services and deliver those services for a couple decades. Yeah. So you're, you, by the way, edit out any of this that you think is not helpful. <laughs> no, it's good to hear over and over. The person then would go to their numbers, going back to that. They'd I'm go so to their... sorry. You're, you're like, okay, but Mark, remember I asked you about people looking at their numbers? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it's so interesting to think that we make it so complicated and we yes. think as a coach, that our business is so important and so complicated. And really, a bookkeeper or accountant looks at it and they're like, oh, this is the easiest, most simple spreadsheet to look at. That's right. So we get our profit and loss statement at the end of the month. And we look at our revenue. We look at our expenses. We remember what our goal is. Yes. And we're, and we're done. Yes, exactly. We ask ourselves... I'm looking at these numbers. I'm I'm noticing the amount that went out and the amount that came in. And then I'm asking myself from the highest level, is this business doing what it's supposed to do in my life? And if what it's supposed to do is in all sincerity with not a shred of sarcasm, if what it's supposed to do is pay, is pay for plane tickets and hotel nights. And if it's doing that, you are winning and I am excited for you. I'm thrilled for you. But if what it's supposed to do is pay off a house or pay for a kid's college or fund a retirement account, if it's supposed to do those things, then we we want to look at the amount of money that went out, the amount of money came in, and then we want to say, I would like to take this many dollars and I would like to put it toward my mortgage or toward my kid's college or toward my new car that I want to buy that I've always wanted or toward any one of these things. And I have to ask myself, is there money available for that? And if the answer is no, hmm. then the next time I'm offered the opportunity to spend X thousand dollars on the group coaching program and fly across the country three or four times, then I have to say to myself, oh, I would be choosing the flights and the hotel nights over oh, the car that I've always wanted. And I have to decide whether I'm okay with that trade-off. And then when I read newsletters and see social media posts and listen to podcasts and people tell me that I can have it all, that there's no such thing as trade-offs, mm -hmm. then I can remember that I looked at my numbers and I noticed that because of the way, I, because the money went there, it can't go here. And that's math. It's addition and subtraction. and I need to make decisions accordingly. I mean, that is really good to know where you want the money to go and then move it out of the account so that it's not there when you look at it. I mean, obviously that would be your own, you would pay yourself so that you could put that money toward your car or your college fund or whatever Yeah, and yeah. get it out of the account. Then you'd look in your account and you'd be like, oh, no money to spend on that. Plaintiff. Well, right. That's right. The reason you're seeing me hesitate is that my observation is it depends on people's default settings. If their default settings are, I don't borrow money, then, then it goes how you just said. Yes. Where they're like, oh, I, I would sign up for that thing, but 
there's no money for, in the checking account for it. But other people will say, oh, but if I sign up for that thing, I'm going to make so much more money. So it's probably wise to borrow to pay for that thing. Yeah. Because I'm going to more than make it up because remember what the sales page said? And again, maybe I don't have a ton of evidence to support that, but I also don't have no evidence to support that. Yeah. There are people who put a $25,000 whatever on a credit card or they borrow against their 401k or their home equity or four credit cards. Okay. I will speak to that. If you're trying to sign up for a thing and you have to ask the service provider or the experience provider, if they can accept payment across multiple credit cards, I want you to have an image in my, in your mind of me, like banging on the window, screaming, <laughs> sobbing, <laughs> like hysterical. It is such a strong signal that something is going horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Not that you'll never be able to pay off those four credit cards, but it's such a strong signal that you've disconnected from any version of reality as the world of finance looks at it. Yeah. If, I, if it's not just that I have to borrow to pay for it, but I have to have multiple credit cards. No, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. This is our down to earth advice for anyone listening. This is really, really good. But you know, I do I this mean, on every on every podcast I go on. This is what I end up doing. <laughs> Giving us, yeah, your I, I was gonna say like your grandfather's advice, what he would tell us. I'm happy to be described that way. Uh also grumpy uncle. <laughs> oh, like, grumpy uncle. <laughs> totally fine. Um <laughs> like people, I have been called like, oh, you're cynical. I'm like, well, maybe. but you've seen it. I mean, maybe that's your personality normally. I don't know because I don't know you that well, but you've seen what happens. And so you have proof of what you're describing. So, but I love how you've kept it so simple. You have a bank account, you look at it once a month, you look at the revenue and the expenses, and you think I'm about what your goal is. How much went out? Uh, in my, in my monthly desk cleaning, are there any subscriptions that I could cancel? Mm. Uh, because that's worthwhile occasionally, although it is, I have pointed out to people, I'll have somebody who comes to me and I'm going to help them with their business finances and we'll be reviewing things and I'll find like a $12 per month subscription and I'll say, okay, so are you still using this? And they'll say, oh no, no, I, I'm going to cancel that. And they say they're going to cancel that as though they've just summited Everest. Like that's the thing. The $12 subscription is going to be the thing that mattered. Yeah. And then in the next breath, they'll tell me that they are signing up for the next $15,000, whatever. And I, I used to be more gentle about this, but now I'm just like, you could pay for that $12 subscription for the rest of your life. Yeah. And never approach. <laughs> the cost of that $15,000 thing. So mm -hmm. re, you, ha you have to reorder in your head what you think winning looks like in your finances because the $12 subscription doesn't really matter. Yeah. But you Just, cancel those. Yeah. A reality check and keep it simple. But I wanted, I did want to talk about this too because I messaged you because in a Facebook group that I'm in, you might be in there too. Someone said, Definitely. oh, Someone talked about all the things that you could write off. Make sure you're writing off these things. And one of them was a photo shoot. Anything related to the photo shoot, your hair, your nails, your clothes you're going to wear would be able to be written off. And I was like, okay, my accountant has told me so many times that I cannot write off any clothes. But I'm like, hey, I, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, she said that you could do it. So I messaged you and I'm like, oh, that's for the photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so then it, you're like, um, maybe you should check with your accountant. So of course I messaged her and she was, she said no. And I just said, Mark, yep, she agreed. No. And I love your response. I've decided approximately 0% of what coaches tell other coaches about taxes is accurate. Everyone is well-intended and pretty much always wrong. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> so I, by the way, you're not crazy. I'm not crazy. It was, it was very recent. It was until very recently that if somebody's going to, uh, if they're going to the blow dry bar or to uh, whatever, and if they said, well, it was for a photo shoot, I, I 
expensed it without hesitation. Oh, I missed that. Thanks. But <laughs> let's hope none of them get audited because it turns out, and I think I sent you a link to that. that right, YouTuber. you did. I watched that. Yeah, she's mm-hmm. so great. She knows a million more times. She knows so much about taxes. I love her. Um, so little of what coaches think is a business expense is a business expense. Clients will tell me, I'm going to Italy for three weeks. I'm like, cool, that sounds amazing. I'm going to write it all off. Oh, you definitely can't do that. <laughs> why, why do you think you can write it all off? It's, it's, quote, for my business. And then I say, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a photo shoot while I'm in Italy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Then maybe a portion of the trip is deductible, but I'm not a tax person. I've just interacted with enough tax people now that my, my antenna are better tuned. Uh huh. But there's not, uh, that's for my business. That's for my business is not a justification for a tax deduction. One of the other great lies, frankly, and I think it's a lie. I think sometimes this is where people wander into really questionable questionable territory ethically is that um, people who are self-employed or who own small businesses don't pay taxes. No, no, no. People who are self-employed and own small businesses pay all of the taxes that get paid. Mm. In our country, if taxes are being paid, it's by us. And, and there's nowhere to hide to be, I want to be very clear. I've looked I've talked to accountants, you know, nerdy, boring accounts who push their glasses up on their nose and shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know what all these people think they're going to do. You're the ones who pay the taxes. If you don't pay the taxes, nobody's paying the taxes. So any ebook, any social media post, any YouTube video, any of it that says you shouldn't be paying taxes because you own a small business or because you're self-employed, it's a lie. And you will find yourself in trouble. You know what the best tax strategy is? Make Mm. more money. And it's really the only one that works reliably. Well, so explain that because I'm like, okay, you're going to make more money and pay more taxes. Yeah, but you'll always have more left over. So your tax rate will increase, but the more money you make, the more money you end up keeping in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. So if you want to save, if you want to have a lower tax consequence, you just have to make more money. That's it. Love it. There's small things that people do. Like they'll at your level, frankly, we Mm -hmm. don't have to talk about numbers, but you're in the neighborhood of where many tax professionals would encourage you to start taking a, uh, a paycheck from your business an actual payroll paycheck. Mm -hmm. That's a near universal strategy. Very boring, very run of the mill, but is, is somewhat beneficial. Yeah. But frankly, it's kind of like the last one other than, finding jobs for your kids and paying them 10 bucks an hour, <laughs> um, which is, it's just legit that. yeah, and be legit. But when people are like, Oh no, I'm going to, I'm going to France and it's a marketing expense. Like, no, it isn't. Oh my gosh. This is so good. I just looked at the time. You got to do your episode with Jesse. So I need to let you go. Well, but anything else you'd say before we wrap up? Well, what I want people to hear because I, he just texted me. What I want people to hear me say, because I think I come on so strong. I I hope they didn't click out in the middle of this episode. I love your business. I love that you're in your business. The work you're doing, all you coaches listening, is so important. It adds so much value to the world. I want your business to perform in whatever way is useful to you in your life. I want your business to do that job for you. It can. I'm all for all of that. Your focus has to be, what is the service that I offer? And am I repeatedly and enthusiastically offering that service forever and then letting the money do whatever job it's supposed to do? But any money that I spend, I have to have a very clear sense that the money I'm spending relates to the the job of my business. And if I don't, just keep it, keep the money. Yeah, that is going to be my biggest takeaway. What is the job of my business? And be really clear. Like, I feel like I just want to grab a journal and go sit down and make that so clear. So thank you for that. Yeah. Lots of, in my opinion, lots of valid jobs for a business to do. Yeah. I don't have, I don't have a complaint about any of them. Yeah. 
you just want to make sure what you're doing and, and you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And the rest of it sort of falls in line behind it. And okay. I, let's do the books. I want to track your, I want to track your stuff for you, but you don't need to be obsessing over it. I know that. Love it. Keep it simple. Okay, Mark, thank you so much for being on here. I'll continue to listen to you and Jesse on your episodes. And thank you so much for doing my books. I very much appreciate it and enjoy not having to do any of it. It's great. And thank you for letting me. It is such a joy for me. I love my work and I love serving great clients like you. Wait, if you're finding this podcast useful, you must check out the Organized Coach Academy. It's my course where I walk you through every step to get your business organized, to get yourself organized, to save money and time, to prepare to hire someone, to do all the things that you want to do in your business with ease. Check that out at simplysquaredaway.com forward slash OCA. Also, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but... I would love it. It's my way of knowing that you're enjoying the podcast if you leave a written review. I have lots of freebies for you. They're linked in the show notes. You can find them in my bio on Instagram at Tracy Hoth. And until next week, have a beautiful day. 